When we think of the Japanese car manufacturers, we think of the big three, Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. But there are plenty of other manufacturers helping Japan punch way above its weight in the global automotive market, and plenty more Japanese companies that tried and failed. Subaru was one of the few survivors, Mike Mitsubishi was born out of a heavy industrial past. Through frugal management, they managed to carve out a niche as the purveyors of sensible four-wheel drive cars, and sometimes not so sensible front-wheel drive cars. Where did they come from? What missteps did they make? And what's next? This is a Subaru story. Wait, before we roll the title sequence, you might be wondering where all the Lego's gone from behind me. Well, I don't do sponsorships, but I've decided to make an exception for U gears for two very good reasons. First of all, they're very cool wooden models with moving pistons and steering, and second, they're a Ukrainian business. But more about that later. Roll titles. The Aircraft Research Laboratory formed in 1915 to build aircraft. After the Second World War, aircraft production was banned and wasn't high on Japanese people's minds. Japan needed basic transportation to get the economy moving, so the company reorganized as Fuji Sangyo Company Limited, no, not that Fuji, and built the Vespa-like Fuji Rabbit Scooter. Like many large companies, they were forced to split up into several smaller companies after the war. Several of these companies, including the scooter division, eventually merged once more to become Fuji Heavy Industries. The next logical step was to build a car, but first it needed a name. Fuji's CEO canvassed the company for suggestions, but none seemed appropriate. He decided to go with a name that he had been cherishing in his heart, Subaru, which was the Japanese name for the Pleiades star cluster, which would become the car brand's logo. Fuji Heavy Industries' first car was a Subaru 1500. They intended to use an engine for the Peugeot 202, but they were blocked from using it and had to design their own engine. 20 cars were built, but Fuji decided not to move to mass production, with competition from Toyota and Prince. The first mass-produced Subaru would only come when the Japanese government asked local industry to produce a small K car to get the country moving. The result was the Subaru 360, a tiny rear-engined four-seater similar to what Fiat was producing at the time. The two-cylinder 360cc engine had been developed in-house. The cockpit was about as basic as you could get. The driver had to manually turn the fuel flow on and off as it was gravity-fed to save on the cost of a fuel pump. The 360 borrowed aircraft design tricks to save weight and so increase acceleration, and the roof was made of fiberglass, still pretty rare in the 50s. Viva! Subaru Young! Viva! There was a 35 horsepower sports version, the Young SS, a convertible, and an estate, the 360 Custom, that gave a little bit more practicality. And the 360 platform was used to create the Sambar van and pickup. And for the next eight years, that was the only platform Fuji produced until the larger Subaru 1000 appeared in 1966. Fuji wanted something bigger to compete with this larger Japanese competition, which were becoming popular with rising Japanese living standards. And the new car would have a new engine, the one litre boxer or flat four. The opportunity to export came when Canadian entrepreneur Malcolm Bricklin arrived in Japan, wanting to license Fuji's scooter. That was going out of production, but Bricklin saw the opportunity to sell the Subaru 360 as cheap and cheerful transport stateside. He set up a group of North American dealerships selling both this car as well as the van and pickup versions, and the updated version of the 1000 saloon and estate marketed as the Star, all with some cheeky commercials. Because it's cheap and ugly. A little Subaru goes a long way to make you happy. Just give it a little love, a little care, and a little gas. A little Subaru, wow. In 1968, Nissan took a roughly 20% stake in Fuji Heavy Industries after the Japanese government ordered car industries to merge to become more competitive. 
Fuji was so much more than just cars though. They produced buses, which would soon start using Nissan parts, trams, railway rolling stock, and they started building aircraft once again when the restriction to manufacture them was lifted. But the car division stuck with restyled versions of their two tried and trusted models, the small K car, now called the Rex, with Sambar K car vans, and the larger four seater, now rebranded as the Leone, or given simple numbers or letters like 1400 or DL. Subarus were selling well, but Fuji didn't have the money other Japanese car companies had to expand to a full range, or weren't willing to borrow to make it happen. But by staying focused on what they had, Subaru cars stayed competitive. The estate version of the Leone got four-wheel drive in time to showcase its use of the 1972 Winter Olympics held in Japan, becoming one of the first mass-produced four-wheel drive passenger cars. The Leone was available in many different shapes, including a two-door coupe, and by the late 1970s it was also sold as a pickup truck. By now, the small 1.0-litre engine had been expanded to 1.6-litres, giving a reasonable level of performance, and a little more convenience with an optional automatic gearbox. But sales in international markets have revolved around one word. Yes, they also tried to talk about fuel efficiency, comfort and reliability, but many adverts ended with the price front and centre. But as Japan's economy boomed and wages rose, the price of Subaru's cars increased. Thankfully, those marketing claims of fuel efficiency and reliability weren't just bluffs. Customers were happy to pay a higher price for Fuji Heavy Industries' quirky cars. To give their cars more exposure and show their cars had bulletproof reliability, from 1980 the Subaru Leone was entered into rallies. The brutal conditions they'd endure would stress parts to the limit and would help improve the quality of the Subarus regular folk got to drive. The Leone and the Rex got regular updates, but the next new Subaru was the Justy that appeared in 1984, initially only for Japan. The Subaru Justy is the lowest priced four wheel drive you can buy, and it can go just about anywhere the highest priced can. Not all of the car was new though, it used a stretched and widened version of the Rex platform with the same doors. The engine was all new though, a 3 cylinder 1 litre or 1.2 litre. There were already quite a few body shapes for the Leone, and one more appeared in 1985, the XT, also known as the Alcyone or Vortex. The Subaru brand was attempting to move away from its pedestrian, dependable image with a fun sports car. It used the same dependable boxer engine that had been slowly improved since its introduction in 1966, but would also use a new six cylinder. That engine wasn't completely new, it shared many components from the four-cylinder boxer engine. The car looked fast, but could only get to 60 in 9.5 seconds, even with a turbocharger. The sports model wasn't the breakout success for Subaru, with a little under 100,000 cars produced over six years. This contrasted to the Leone line that was selling well in the USA with record sales. Clearly, even more sales could come from a wider lineup. A deal was done to rebadge the Isuzu Trooper SUV as the Subaru Bighorn, but Subaru's big bet was expanding its lineup with its first all new car for 18 years, the 1989 Subaru Legacy. This is a little more light. It came as both a saloon and a state, introducing a whole new level of refinement and another brand new engine. Like the Leone, the Legacy got both two and four wheel drive. In fact, four-wheel drive was becoming a bit of a key Subaru selling point, especially in North America. This was a vast country of extreme weather, and customers there had been the first to embrace Subaru's four-wheel drive cars in large numbers in the 1970s. Subaru was relatively unique in offering four-wheel drive not on trucks or SUVs, but on regular family cars. And by the 1980s, it could be specified with an automatic, essential for North American sales. Four-wheel drive could get the family around in those cold winter months or go into the wilderness, although it wasn't always perfect. And unlike other permanent four-wheel drive systems, fuel economy didn't take a big hit. America was Subaru's largest market at this point, and they wanted larger cars, so the legacy seemed to make a lot of sense. 
Subaru pitched it as a luxury car, following it up in 1991 with a four-wheel drive SVX Grand Tourer with Jajaro styling and the same six-cylinder engine as the Legacy. Inside it was clear Subaru was going after its upscale Japanese competitors and their luxury brands. The rest of Subaru's lineup got a much needed update in 1992, completing the transformation with the new Vivio and Impreza. The pint size Vivio K car was more for home consumption. The Impreza was squarely aimed at the export market, and with the legacy being built in the USA, Subaru was hoping sales would increase now it wasn't so constrained by US import quotas. It seemed like a recipe for success, but US sales showed the public wasn't Imprezad. They didn't see Subaru as a luxury car maker, and the slow selling SVX would be axed after just five years. Subaru looked for answers as to why sales were failing, and the spotlight fell not on their cars, but on the new ad agency hired in 1991, producing quirky ads which didn't sell. In 1993, that ad agency was gone, and Subaru's new ad agency refocused not on the luxury market, but on core Subaru buyers, educators, healthcare professionals, IT workers, outdoorsy types, and lesbians. It seemed this demographic wanted something for outdoor trips and hauling things just like many people wanted, but liked Subaru's low-key image that wasn't too flashy. Ads focused on why their core group wanted a Subaru. Healthcare professionals could get to work in winter months with four-wheel drive. Outdoor trips with a four-wheel drive Subaru estate were so much easier. And in an age when advertising to the gay community would turn off some straight consumers, Subaru ads found subtle ways of signalling to the lesbian market. But it wasn't all subtle nods so people wouldn't be offended. Subaru would be public about its support, sponsoring gay pride parades. In short, Subaru didn't try to be more than it was. It concentrated on its target market, and the sales took care of themselves. Those outdoorsy types were starting to be tempted with a new batch of sport utility vehicles that were gaining popularity. But like SUVs of old, on twisty highways, the ladder chassis handled like a pig, and fuel economy was abysmal. With little money for brand new cars, Subaru's legacy got a light off-roading makeover as the Outback in 1994, and the smaller Impreza as the Outback Sport. The Impreza got even more practical as the Forester in 1997. All three cars sold well, providing a good compromise between feeling safe on the road and everyday practicality. By the end of the 90s, sales were finally back to 1980s levels. The Audi Quattro showed light cars with four-wheel drive were the way to go if you wanted to succeed in rallying. Subaru had dipped its toe into the rallying scene in the 1980s, but it plunged headfirst in the 1990s with the help of ProDrive, first with the Legacy, and then the lighter Impreza in 1993. By 1991, they'd won the British Rally Championships, winning again in 1992 and 93. By 1995, Colin McRae won the World Rally Championship in a Subaru Impreza. Soon, Subaru and Mitsubishi would be locked in a battle for rally victories, selling ever more insane turbo-boosted family cars in the process. Renault and Nissan forged a joint alliance in the late 1990s, and this meant Nissan needed to sell its minority stake in Subaru parent Fuji Heavy Industries. That approximately 20% stake was sold to General Motors in 1999. This led to a series of badge engineering between the two companies. The Forester would go to India as the Chevrolet Forester, the Impreza would be sold in the US as a Saab 92X for some reason, and the Opel Zafira would be sold in Subaru showrooms in Japan as the Travique. Subaru continued finding new ways to package its existing cars with the Subaru Baja in 2002. It was a pickup com family saloon, what Australians might refer to as a ute, but Subaru called a multiple choice vehicle. Hmm, yes. Subaru had high hopes for this car, expecting 24,000 sales per year, but limited advertising and customer apathy meant only 30,000 cars were sold over six years. Subaru's level-headed customers saw this as being neither one thing or the other, and surely a covered boot or a state shape would be more practical. Maybe a crossover would sell better. The Subaru Tribeca launched in 2005, again using an existing platform and engines to save money, in this case from the Legacy. 
It was the first Subaru passenger car to offer seven seats, and interior comfort and ride handling were very good. But Subaru was entering a crowded market, and those quirky looks turned customers off. With General Motors owning 20% of Subaru, there was always going to be a Saab version, but the year the Tribeca launched, GM lost a colossal $10.6 billion, which led to plans for restructuring. It was forced to sell its stake in Subaru, and Toyota would pick up some of those shares, meaning they now had an almost 9% stake in their Japanese rival. Given the flops of the Baja and the Tribeca, one of the first benefits of this deal was using Subaru's spare production capacity at their Indiana factory to make the Toyota Camry. Toyota owned half of Daihatsu, and another benefit of joining the Toyota Club was access to both companies' stable of vehicles. Subaru's lineup instantly ballooned, with the Daihatsu Move becoming the Subaru Stella, the Subaru Dex was a rebadged Toyota BB, Daihatsu's Tanto XEK car was rebranded as the 2009 Subaru Lucra, and the Toyota Rakris became the Subaru Trezia. The Subaru Sambar light truck had been on sale since the 1960s, and would be replaced with a rebadged Daihatsu Atre van. Subaru had started as a K-car manufacturer, and their new model in 2011, the Playo, was a rebadged Mira. Suddenly, Subaru was awash with new cars, and Subaru dealerships in Japan looked remarkably similar to their Daihatsu counterparts, but it allowed Subaru's development team to focus on its larger cars that made the most money. Subaru still sold the Opel Zafira in Japan as the Trevik, but their partnership with GM and Opel had ended. The replacement would be all Subaru, built on the upcoming legacy platform with an Impreza engine. Subaru were the masters of reuse. The Exige MPV would be sold in Japan and Australia, but it wouldn't come to the West. They had the slow-selling seven-seat Tribeca crossover. Once Toyota got a seat at the table, it liked what Subaru was doing, and increased their stake to over 16% in 2008 they'd kick off their first joint development, the Toyota 86 Scion FRS, released in 2012, and it sold as a Subaru BRZ. But history should have told Subaru that, WRX notwithstanding, Subaru's organic wheat germ customers weren't coming into Subaru dealers looking for sports cars. Sales of the BRZ were pitifully slow. But that's not to say that sales were going badly in Subaru's main export market, North America. Quite the opposite, in fact. Subaru's bread and butter were family cars that could go anywhere, and the latest generation seemed to strike a chord with customers. In 2008, the Great Recession hit car manufacturers across the board, but not Subaru. In 2008, sales were 187,000. They increased to 216,000 in 2009, and 263,000 the following year, largely due to the new fourth-generation Outback that had grown over six centimeters in height to make it into a pseudo-crossover customers preferred over the quirky Tribeca. It helped that Subaru was riding high in consumer reports ratings as well. Consumers felt it was a good brand that was focused on safety and a care for the environment, with cars that were more fuel efficient than the gas guzzling competition. And with Subaru's make do and mend frugal attitude to reusing parts, their cars were reasonably priced, ideal during a global recession. Subaru followed this up with more of the same, the 2012 Subaru Crosstrek, designed to replace the Impreza-based Outback Sport. It was, of course, based on the Impreza with Impreza engines. In North America, Subaru had a large distribution network, and prices were in line with cars from mainstream rivals. But in Europe, where their presence was smaller, they weren't competitive with the likes of the mighty Nissan Qashqai. Yet another reconfiguration of the Impreza platform launched in 2014, the Subaru Levorg, short for Legacy Revolution Touring, apparently, and replacing the Subaru Legacy Touring with something that was more evolution than revolution. Despite the Legacy name, the Levorg would use the shorter Impreza platform. Four years later, another four-wheel drive car appeared, the Ascent, also known as the Avoltis, a larger SUV trying to succeed where the Tribeca had failed. Subaru's first mass-market car, the 360, was reused with many different cars to maximize revenue. It was a strategy that worked, and over 40 years later, they were doing the same thing. 
Subarus were still built by Fuji Heavy Industries, but that name didn't represent the company's main focus. So in 2017, they finally renamed the company to simply Subaru, the name Fuji CEO had been cherishing in his heart all those years ago. Coinciding with Toyota's minority stake, Subaru have seen a stratospheric rise in sales as their fit and finish improved to something approaching luxury levels and customers warmed to Subaru's no-nonsense, go-anywhere line of vehicles. By exiting the K-car market, it allowed them to focus all their resources on the main part of their business and they've reaped the rewards. As to the 2020s, Subaru's first electric vehicle is the Solterra, a much better name than the one Toyota gave it, the BZ4X. I mean, why? Is that memorable? Is it a catchy name? <laughs> you might just as well have called it the Toyota R2D2. It's almost like Toyota is trying not to sell you an electric car. Anyway, the Solterra is Subaru's first dip into making electric vehicles. It's the next step in a long road from making scooters through K cars to finding their niche with a little pizzazz along the way. As I said at the start, and as you know, I don't do promotions, but as you can see from the models I normally put behind me, U Gears models are the sort of thing I like. The retro car has a folding roof, working latching doors, steering, moving pistons, and if you wind it up, it'll propel itself along. The dragster has more power, obviously, and kicks up on two wheels when it starts. And all out of just a few bits of laser cut wood and elastic bands. But building these models is what I find interesting. I built the Roadster and it was a lot of fun. I've built laser cut wooden models in the past. I made a working clock a few years ago and New Gears has a couple of working clocks which I wouldn't mind getting my hands on like the Aero clock which is similar to what I built, a fully working mechanical clock just made out of wood. They obviously have some clever engineers working for them as they've produced contraptions like this mono wheel with stabilizing wheels that fold up when it gets going. The suggested age for these models I've shown is 14, but they do have a whole range of easier models like a set of four fidget vehicles. None of these models use glue or special tools though, just some sandpaper and a bit of wax to lubricate the joints which comes in the box. So if you or someone you know likes building models, this might just be yours or their sort of thing. What drew me to Lego Technic and U Gears models is recreating real mechanical systems like steering and piston movement in plastic and wood. But the thing that I love about U Gears is that they're a Ukrainian company working out of Kyiv, probably not the easiest thing to be doing right now. Other than U Gear sending me these models, I've not taken any form of payment for this sponsorship as I believe they're a company making really cool models and should be supported. They ship all over the world, they ship from outside of Ukraine, so there shouldn't be any delays from the war that's going on at the time of filming. So maybe take a look at models from ugearsmodels.com for you, or maybe a gift for someone else. Thanks for watching and sitting through the promotion, and I'll see you in the next video.